We have been receiving questions on our website, actually, um, Dr. Karamanian. Um, so I'll just quickly go through them. Some of them we have already answered through our discussion. Um, uh, the first one is, um, given that one has a three Tesla MRI showing the lesion, does it make sense to do an FLA without a biopsy first or to do the biopsy at the same time and get the results a few days later? Or is the biopsy result important prior to the FLA? That's from Ed. Sure. The, it's important to have the biopsy results prior to the FLA. And the reason is, there are many reasons. So let's say that it really turns out to be a Gleason, a low volume Gleason 6, or even a moderate volume Gleason 6, but only Gleason 6. Then the patient needs to, you know, not while they're on a procedural table and sedated, but while they're, they have their, their thoughts clear and collected and they can think clearly and really evaluate, okay, do I want a treatment or do I want to just stay on active surveillance? Um, that's, they need to be able to make that decision. Um, and th what you can't do if you biopsy an ablate immediately. Another thing is that, let's say it turns out to be a Gleason 9, and the patient is, you know, 55 and has a life expectancy apart from the prostate cancer of more than 30 years. Um, that's going to be a patient where that should undergo more aggressive therapy. Um, and so uh, it's important to be able to tailor the treatment to the patient, which you can't do until you have the pathology results. So are you telling me you would never do this on a patient with a Gleason 9? I would never do this on a young patient with a Gleason 9 who, um, uh, who has a long life expectancy. Um, now, when I say never, I mean with given the current data. If we 20 years from now, I might, depending on what the data shows. But and the reason is that Gleason 9 has Gleason 5, uh, com Gleason component 5 inside of it. And those cancers can really spread in a way that uh, you can't see well with MRI. And so if I don't feel comfortable that I can ablate the, the index lesion plus a margin, then I, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to treat the patient. A high-risk disease needs um, aggressive therapy, um, not intermediately aggressive therapy like FLA or not no therapy like active surveillance. Um, aggressive disease needs aggressive therapy. Thank you. Next question, Thank please. you, Doctor. The next, yeah, the next one is, uh, what is the accuracy of 3TMP MRI for lesion size? How small a lesion can be detected? Well, so that goes um, a, an important part of that is answering that question is the quality of the imaging at the center. So they're going to, the better the quality of the imaging, the smaller the lesions you can see. But less than five millimeters, it it's tough for um, for a three T multiparametric MRI to pick up a lesion that's less than five millimeters. Now, having said that, what are the chances that a lesion that's less than five millimeters is going to actually become clinical disease? Well, maybe at some point in the future, but, it, but um, we would be able to pick it up as it grows. Uh, so there are small cancers and definitely small Gleason 6s that 3T MPMRI will miss. But I would argue if a patient has a three millimeter, um, a three millimeter Gleason 6, you shouldn't even treat it. So who cares if you don't see it? If they have, you know, a three millimeter Gleason 7 cancer, it's probably going to grow to the point where you can see it on the MRI before, um, before anything bad happens. Now, having said that, we do know that, you know, M that MRI for the prostate is not 100%. Um, but there's only one test that's really 100% for prostate cancer, and that's a radical prostatectomy. Um, but obviously that's far and away overkill as a diagnostic modality. Um, so one of the great things about multiparametric MRI is it tends to miss clinically insignificant cancers, and it's very sensitive for clinically significant cancers. But if the MRI is negative and um, a patient ha is in a high-risk clinical scenario, they should still undergo a blind trust biopsy. Thank you, Doctor. Now, there's another question. What role does PSA testing play post-FLA? Also, what type of increase should be expected over time? Sure. So, what we found is that the PSA 
um, uh, drops um, at the first um, measurement post FLA, which is usually done at six months, and then it usually stabilizes at about a year, and then between year one and year two. Now, if it if what we found is that when it drops um, to less than 30% of its original value, um, the chances of having residual or recurrent disease is extremely low. Um, when it uh, when it drops um, in at 50% of the original level, then it's there's still a very low risk of residual disease. What we do is we use PSA to in order to track. Um, I mean, just like you use PSA after radiation or after surgery, if it starts to go up and if it goes above the um, pre-ablation um, number, then we're, then we're worried whether or not we see anything on the MRI. <clears throat> Thank you, Doctor. Uh, next question is, what are the chances of patients losing sexual function as a result of this procedure? And once sure. it's so, lost, are there ways to recover it? Yeah. Sure. So... Um, if there's bilateral disease where it's going right up to the neurovascular bundle on each side and the nerve is right against the, the capsule, you know, then the patients are um, at a higher risk of having um, erectile dysfunction. Overall, the risk is of developing impotence from this procedure is less than 10%. Um, in many, in, with patients who have cancer that's unilateral and not going right up against the nerve, um, the chance of having any effect on sexual function is going to be even, uh, is going to be very low. Um, now, the, or having, let me rephrase that, having a significant impact on sexual function is going to be, the risk is very low in those patients. Um, there, we, have, we do know of a phenomenon where the nerve can sort of be stunned and then the patients will regain sexual, where they'll have a drop in their erectile function immediately after the procedure, and then over the, over the course of a few months, it'll come back. Um, we, so, sorry, let me try to be a little more clear. When a patient has sexual problems after focal laser ablation, it's, it's immediately apparent within the few weeks after the procedure. Um, there, it does tend to come back to varying degrees over the course of a year or two with patients, but again, that's going to be the small minority of patients who deal with significant sexual function, uh, significant sexual problems after focal laser ablation. Uh, one of the things we do is we also supplement patients with Cialis to try to improve that function um, as needed. Is, is that an age-related effect, or is there no real sort of indicator of, of, of heightened risk. I'm sorry, say that again? Is, is, is that in any way related to the patient's age or, or anything else? I mean, in other words, do, do you have any ideas about why some patients are at greater risk than others? Yes. Uh, so for cancers that are right next to the neurovascular bundle where you're ablating right up to the nerve, um, that's a risk factor. Having bilateral disease in a problematic area is a risk factor. And yes, um, Older patients tend to have lower baseline sexual uh, um, erectile function. And so the lower um, a patient is starting off, the more at risk that a little bit of a, of a hit will have a significant impact um, in terms of their sexual function. Thank you. So, you know, a 55-year-old who has fantastic sexual function and you singe the nerve a little bit, um, if you irritate the nerve a little bit, uh, oftentimes it wouldn't notice any impact. So I, I don't know if you think we have time for one more question, Priya? Um, I think uh, that's uh, all the questions that we have from the listeners as of now. Uh, Mike, if you have okay. a question, we do have a minute more. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I, I just want to thank Dr. Dr. Charamanian for his time. I think this has been a very helpful introduction for a lot of people. Um, we all understand that new techniques take time to, to prove themselves. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, as I think I've said to you in a couple of emails, I encourage you to encourage your colleagues to publish as much as they can, as fast as they can, because I think that will only help everybody to understand what the opportunities are here. 
I agree, 100 percent. And believe me, I'm making efforts along those. Um, I'm trying to make it happen. Thank you.